hello, I'm uh, Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, and I am uh, the co-director of the Evolutionary Medicine Program here at UCLA, along with Dr. D Dr. Dan Blumstein. And uh, I am really privileged to introduce our final speaker of the day, Wade Davis. Wade Davis has been described as a rare combination of scientist, scholar, poet, and passionate defender of all of life's diversity. He's explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, and his work as an ethnographer, writer, photographer, and filmmaker has taken him to East Africa, Borneo, Nepal, Peru, Polynesia, Tibet, New Guinea, Mongolia, and I'm editing out most of the other countries and regions. He has published hundreds of scientific and popular articles on subjects ranging from Haitian voodoo and Amazonian myth and religion to global biodiversity uh, and traditional use of psychotropic drugs and ethnobotany of South American Indians. He has written many critically acclaimed and best-selling books, and his photography has appeared in dozens of books and hundreds of magazines. He's an equally prolific filmmaker, creating programs such as National Geographic series, Ancient Voices in Modern World, and Light at the Edge of the World, the four-hour ethnographic documentary series, which has aired in over 165 countries on National Geographic. He has spent years in the Amazon and in the Andes studying ethnobotany and holds degrees in anthropology, biology, and a doctorate in ethnobotany from Harvard. It was at Harvard that, I believe, he met and was mentored by Richard Evans Schultes, the father of ethnobotany and the focus of the talk we are about to hear. On a personal note, I actually met Wade 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate taking a course on the Shivante Indians of Brazil, which was being given by the late Professor David Mayberry Lewis. Professor Mayberry Lewis brought Wade into the seminar to share stories of his field work and his research. And although it was decades ago, I clearly recall being just a little starstruck by this already expansive, courageous, creative scholar and thinker. So it is really a thrill for me to introduce uh, Wade Davis to you. As I'm sure you heard from at least one speaker this morning on June 18th, 1858, what must have been arguably the most important historic letter in the history of biology reached Charles Darwin from an unknown correspondent flush and fever in the Spice Islands. And I was struck by listening to Tim, an old friend of mine, how when we think of Wallace, we always look at him through the, either the lens of his obviously famous work in Southeast Asia, and those of us who are more focused on the Amazon through his extraordinary explorations there. And when we think of Wallace in the Amazon, he is inextricably linked to two other great scholars, explorers. And in fact, that letter itself could not have been written to Darwin had not Wallace's been life saved four years previously in the, bout, in the, in the midst of another malarial fever on the banks of a distant river in a continent half a world away. And what drew these fantastic characters together, Alfred Wallace, Richard Spruce, and of course the great bug collector Henry Bates, was the fact that they were a different kind of naturalist. They were all self-taught, all of modest means, all scions of a kind of new imperial idea that thrust naturalists along with archaeologists and missionaries and traders and surveyors and map makers as the sort of forward scouts of empire. And it all began in 1848 when Wallace wrote a letter to Henry Bates suggesting that rather immodestly, that they set off on a journey together, as he put it, to solve the problem of the origin of species. At the time, Bates was working as an apprentice, making socks in a dreary Midland mill. Uh, there was no choice uh, in his mind. He was off. And they left England in the last days of April, 1848, arriving in Belen at the mouth of the Amazon on May 28th, just a year before Richard Spruce got there. Now, this is where it gets kind of curious. Having set off together, they spent four months together in the forest in the environs of Belen, up the Tocantins River, 
But then for reasons unknown, they went their separate ways. And for seven months, they wandered on their own. They came together once more in the summer of 1849 when Bates returned to the city on the evening of July 19th. Wallace had already been there since early June, awaiting the arrival of his brother Herbert, who indeed docked in Belen on July 12th, and traveling with Herbert was, of course, the legendary bryologist from Yorkshire, Richard Spruce. Now, it is not actually known whether or not Spruce, Wallace, and Bates ever even entered the forest together, but for a naturalist, the very thought is sublime. But if they did, it would have had to have been only during the 11 days between uh, Bates's return to Belen on the 19th and Wallace's subsequent departure upriver at the, end of, at the beginning of August. Now, many writers have rather romantically and erroneously suggested that the three men came together three months later, four months later in November at the town of Santarem at the mouth of the Tapajos. But that's actually not true. Wallace indeed had taken up residence there, but in fact, Bates reached Santarem on October 9th and left the next morning for Obidos, a small town further upriver. Spruce arrived in Santarem on November 19th, the very same day that Bates, further upriver, left Obidos for Manaus. Now, it's kind of curious. Three Englishmen drawn together by their passion for natural history in, in, two of them who had sailed from England together, and yet they spent almost no time in the forest together. But that indeed was to be the pattern of their lives, each following their own course, only vaguely aware of the whereabouts of the other, occasionally coming together as Spruce and Wallace did in 1851, and again a year later at the, on the Valpez when uh, Spruce saved his life. And what these men felt or thought about each other is really difficult to know, for their sentiments are completely buried in the formality of the Victorian age. But one thing is absolutely certain. Their explorations utterly transformed our knowledge of the Amazon. Henry Bates remained for 11 years and would collect over 14,000 species of insects, of which, if you can imagine, 8,000 were new to science. Wallace only stayed for four years before disease and his death of his beloved brother Herbert sent him back to England. And I'm sure someone mentioned the terrible story that on the way back to England, off Bermuda, his ship caught fire and he watched from a longboat as flames consumed all of his collections made over the course of those four years, including 52 live animals that he had brought down the Valpes from the upper reaches of the Northwest Amazon. And long after Wallace had overcome this tragedy and moved on to Southeast Asia, and long after even Bates was back in Britain, Spruce remained in the forests of the Amazon. Uh, in a series of journeys and explorations, he would collect 20,000 botanical specimens, travel by canoe 4,000 miles, record the vocabularies of 21 previously uncontacted indigenous groups, and unlike Wallace, who kind of liked the idea of Indian life but absolutely disdained individual Indians, Richard Spruce immediately, through the metaphor of botany, slipped right into their world. So he was the very first to identify ayahuasca, the other great hallucinogen, yopo. He was the first to see Amazonian coca made. He was the first to get seeds of cinchona, the source of quinine, the only treatment then available for malaria. He also, years before Wickham's so-called theft of the rubber seeds from Brazil, Spruce had identified no fewer than six new species in the genus uh, Hevea. Now, I think that the interesting thing about these men is that there is no naturalist alive today who works in the Amazon, man or woman, who does not invoke one of these characters as his or her sort of primordial influence. And it really doesn't have anything to do whether you're an entomologist, you don't necessarily like Bates, you might prefer Wallace, and you could be an ethnographer and prefer Spruce, because you might, especially if, like me, you're into drugs. And, and, <laughs> but the point is these, these men represented not just the beginning of this kind of scholarship that we engage in reflexively today, the fact that we don't have to be 
aristocrats. You know, we don't have to be humble. We can be ordinary people, cobble together a little bit of money, and you can go out and change the history of science. And this bond between these three individuals and all naturalists who came later is almost a sacred connection. And that's really the connection I'd like to talk about with you today, because of course the student, as any professor knows, is as important as a teacher in the lineage of knowledge. And of all connections that grew out of this trio of extraordinary explorers and naturalists, there is one that surpasses all, because this is the only case where, in fact, the protege surpassed the achievements of the mentor. And the man in question, of course, is Richard Evans Schultes. He was to the 20th century what Spruce was to the 19th. I first knew him as a legend on the Harvard campus, a kindly professor who shot blowguns in class and kept outside his door a bucket of peyote buttons available to his students as an optional laboratory experiment. In 1941, having solved the problem of Tehuanacatl, having discovered the magic mushrooms and sparked the psychedelic era, he slipped away into the northwest Amazon in 1941, where he remained for 12 in uninterrupted years, traveling down unknown rivers, living amongst unknown peoples, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the neotropical rainforest. If Richard Spruce in 17 years would collect 20,000 plants, Schultes in 12 would collect 30,000, including 2,000 medicinal plants previously unknown to science, and no fewer than 300 new species of vascular plants. But Schultes was an odd choice to become a 60s icon because his politics were wildly conservative. Uh, he didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> in fact, the only way a colleague said of Schultes that he could go native would be to go to London. Now, now to understand the link between Schultes and Richard Spruce, you literally have to accept the possibility that the seed of one generation can be born in the next and that the spirit of one long dead can reach across time not merely to inspire, but to mold the dreams of another. Late in life, Schultes was asked by a journalist whether it was not possible that he had consciously or even sub subconsciously modeled his life on that of Richard Spruce. And in an odd sense, they first met 20 years, 30 years after Spruce had died in 1922 in a hospital room in Boston when seven-year-old Richard Evans Schultes lay dying with a childhood fever. By complete chance, his father, who was a simple man, a plumber, had plucked out of the local library two volumes. The title of that were Notes of a Botanist on the Amazon and Andes, being the records of travel on the Amazon its tributaries during the years 1849 to 1864. These two well-worn journals were, of course, Spruce's journal entries and letters, which had been edited together after his death by no other than Alfred Wallace. Now, Schultes obviously was not conscious of this kind of atavistic moment, but you would have thought perhaps that he was, given what unfolded. Some years later, he found himself the first of his family to go to university. He was so poor that they couldn't attend the dorms at Harvard, and he took a job filing cards in what turned out for him to be a world of wonder, the most eclectic library in North America, the Economic Botany Library at Harvard's Botanical Museum. In between the folios of Brunfels and the monographs of distant tribes and the accounts of strange plants that were then known as the Fantastica, Schultes fell away into trance. And he took a course that had been taught at Harvard longer than any other in the history of the university, Plants and Human Affairs. And the iconoclastic professor, Oakes Ames, who hated the federal government and had insisted throughout all of Prohibition that his students brew and distill and ferment copious amounts of booze as a laboratory experiment, had his, had his limits when it came time to these plants that we now call the hallucinogens. And so the students had to do a book report, and Schultes had so much other homework that he rushed to the back of the room, plucked from the shelf the thinnest volume he could find, put it in his satchel, and returned to his tenement in East Boston. And that night, when he drew that volume out of his 
book bag, History Was Made because that book turned out to be the only monograph then available in the English language that described the stunning pharmacological effects of peyote, of mescaline. And throughout the night, this very conservative lad from East Boston read of visions of orb-like brilliance that descended from the heavens over the consciousness of the consumer. He went back to Professor Ames the next day and he said, I must know this plant. And Ames said, you can study it for your thesis. I might even be able to get you a grant. Of course, the grant came from Professor Ames' own pocket. And that's how Schultes began to study peyote. Now, he read of the plant before he headed off into the field. He knew that the plant had originated in the Sierra Madre Occidental with the Taramara and the Huicho. And he knew that it had reached the Great Plains through this extraordinary moment of societal and cultural collapse. It was not an original practice in the American Plains. In fact, it came into the Plains in the wake of the collapse of the Great Plains cultures as a kind of pharmacological shortcut to the distant metaphysical realms that had been tr traditionally reached by the sun dance and by the pain of initiation of ordeal and of isolation in the vision quest. And it reached into the plains from the Huichol through the hands of a Comanche by the name of Quana Parker, who had been wounded in battle and had a vision in his delirium of a sacred plant. And it was from the Kiowa that this plant would disperse to almost every culture in North America, the highest rate of diffusion of any major sort of religious artifact in the history of anthropology. And of course, this is a world that had collapsed within a generation, a century perhaps, of its birth. In 1871, Buffalo still outnumbered people in North America. Within seven years, they were a shadow in the prairie. And when the last of the Great Plains cultures was reduced to the reservations, Philip Sheridan, who had orchestrated that campaign, suggested to the U.S. Congress that a commemorative medal be minted that would have on the one side of it a dead buffalo and on the other side of it a dead Indian. This was explicit policy, of course, of the U.S. cavalry to deny the Indian people their commissary. But Schultes, in 1928, have ne having never been let west of the Charles River, got into this beat-up old 1928 Studebaker and bumped and rumbled west to Oklahoma Territory where he lived with the Kiowa and five days a week for eight influential weeks of his young life, he ate peyote. <laughs> he was the last generation of scholars to know the peoples who had actually known the cultures of the plains, people like Mary Buffalo, Heap of Bears, Charlie Charcoal. And he realized that this sacrament was somehow essential to the well-being, and that the key to the cultural survival of the people was their ability to take this journey to the divine. And this, as I say, he did every second night for that long, wonderful summer. And you would never know from this photograph in which he has apparently not even loosened the red Harvard tie around his neck that he has just come out of a peyote ceremony that has sent a dozen Kiowa on a collective journey to their gods. The Kiowa were an amazing people, incidentally. They were the individual tribe that killed more white people per capita than any other. They owned more horses than any other. Every year they would come together when the cottonwood seed set for the sun dance, and they would put the teepees in a horseshoe to the rising sun. The taime symbol, the fetish symbol of the sun, would then be unveiled the, the, with the essence of the buffalo within it. And there was always one warrior who stood at the opening of the encirclement of teepees following the sun day and night with his vision, literally allowing himself to be driven blind so that metaphorically the people in the coming year would learn how to see. So Schultes came back to Harvard a different person. And he testified that summer of 1933, 36 rather, on Congress with Krober saying that this was a plant that was absolutely legitimate part of the traditional practice. Pretty heady stuff for a kid from the tenements of East Boston. And while he was in Washington working on his undergraduate thesis, he stumbled on the clue that allowed him to solve the greatest mystery 
in the history of ethnobotany. He found a peyote specimen in the herbarium with a note attached to it addressed to the late director of the herbarium, Dr. Rose, saying that, I understand your man Safford, employed by the Smithsonian, says that Tewanakatl, flesh of the gods in Nahuatl, is in fact peyote. He's a fool. It's just as the Spanish said, it's a mushroom, and I've seen it used. Well, Schultes knew that Tewanakatl was not peyote, but this clue opened his imagination. Having just jumped off one Greyhound bus from Tulsa because the Studebaker broke down, he jumped on another one from Mexico City. And then he took a train south, and his companion was this engineer, German engineer B.P. Reiko. And on the way south, Schultes discovered two things. First of all, he discovered he'd better improve his Spanish because he turned to a little old native woman beside him and said to her, Senora, cuantos años tiene? Hoping that he had asked her how old she was, but by leaving off the tilde on the enye, he had inadvertently asked her how many assholes she had. Uh, <laughs> she, she, re she, of course, replied, solamente uno, uh, um, um, as, if he might, as if he might have more than one. And then, to his horror, he discovered that B.P. Reiko was an ardent Nazi. So there he was, not a year from the outbreak of Hitler's war, traveling into the mountains of the Mazatec with an ardent Nazi as a companion. But this, then things got even more interesting because there turned out to be another team of explorers seeking the mystery of Tewanakatl, and this was led by Bernard Bevan, who was Ernst Bevan's brother, who was later in Churchill's cabinet. This was British Secret Service. So in a scenario right out of Indiana Jones, these two teams converge on this small village in the mountains of Ma the Mazatec country, and of course, Schultes was the one who found the mushrooms, the little ones that spring up. And the thread of that mystery was not picked up until after the war, because many of the principals died during the war. And there was a curious banker called Gordon Wasson, married to a Russian. Russians love mushrooms. And they had concocted this theory that somewhere on Earth there were people who worshipped mushrooms. They didn't know where, but somewhere this happened. And Robert Graves, the poet, sent Wasson, Schultes' 1940 paper, an American anthropologist, identifying Tewanakatl as a mushroom. Wasson contacted Schultes. Wasson then, on Schultes' instruction, made a beeline for Wautla in Mazatec country, and in a famous moment, he became the first outsider actually to ingest the mushrooms in sacred context. He then wrote it up for Life magazine, and you'll see the cover with uh, the discovery of mushrooms that cause strange visions. Well, if that wasn't the understatement of the century. And an editor picked a snappy title, Seeking the Magic Mushrooms, and then the question became, um, uh, what's in these mushrooms? So Schultes and Wasson got hold of about 64 mushrooms, and they sent them to uh, this man, Albert Hoffman, at Sandoz Laboratories. And Albert um, divided the stash into half and fed half to his dog. Uh, nothing happened. So he ate the other half, and something did happen. Uh, his laboratory began to look like Mexico. <laughs> And he feared that he'd be washed away into the whirlwind of color. Now, such an experience might have unnerved an ordinary scientist, but Hoffman was not of that sort. In 1938, he had been working and had successfully synthesized the indole alkaloids from the strange phenomenon called St. Anthony's fire. This is a um, fungal parasite of rye crops that would periodically cause European villages to go mad, people would become crazy, their noses and fingertips would rot and fall off, and it was exactly the vasoconstricting ability of that alkaloid that he was investigating as a potential medicinal drug. And in 1943, he decided on a whim to make the 25th series of indole alkaloid derivatives in this protocol. And as he was doing so, his fingertips got a little bit numb, and then his head began to swirl, and he didn't have any gasoline, so he went home on his bicycle. And it turned out to be the most momentous bicycle ride in history, because the substance that had gone through his skin was nothing less than lysergic acid diethylamide 25, LSD. So on the way home, Dr. Hoffman went on the world's first acid trip. And so he was quite prepared to identify, as he did, psilocybin as the active ingredient of the mushrooms. But then it came time to identify the second of the sacred plants that Schultes had found, Ololuiki, which turned out to be 
a morning glory, which is precisely why in the summer of 1967, florists all over America experienced a run on morning glory varieties known as heavenly gates. And it turns out that the active ingredient in the morning glories was an indole alkaloid, one methyl group away from LSD, which meant that Schultes had in fact discovered LSD in nature uh, four years before Hoffman synthesized it in the lab in the seeds of a humble morning glory uh, long worshipped by the Aztec. Well, all of this came to the attention of Timothy Leary and Richard Albert, who had subscriptions to Life magazine. And the psychedelic gold rush was on. But by this point, of course, Professor Schultes had long gone and come back from the Amazon. He had arrived in Bogota in the fall of 1941 when the church spire in the Santander Plaza was the largest building in the city. He left immediately across the Paramos to the homeland of the Kamsa, the headwaters of the Putumayo River, uh, the valley of Sibandoy, where he counted 1,600 individuals of one tree in the genus um, Burgmansia, the tree daturas, um, uh, contained uh, powerful tropane alkaloids that induced a psychotic state of delirium, visions of hellfire, burning thirst, amnesia, and a sensation of flight. This is actually the origin of the witch and the broomstick on Halloween. You know how um, uh, you know, the hexing herbs of Europe, belladonna, that's why Mona Lisa had those great almond eyes because it was an it, atropine is a, it, it dilates the pupil and it was a cosmetic. She couldn't see anything, but she looked great. And, and also, um, these drugs are topically active. Scopolamine are those patches used for seasickness. And so the, the, the actual broomstick was an applicator because a very effective way for a woman to take the drugs is through the moist tissue, the genitalia. So we, the, that was the applicator. So her journey wasn't a literal journey through space, but a journey through the hallucinogenic landscape of her imagination. That, that's just something to lay on the PTA next October. Uh, <laughs> and, and he found four new species of hallucinogens within a month, working with curanderos like Salvador Chindoy. He went over the mountains in the homeland of the Ingano. They had a curious decoction they drank every day that caused your fingers to go numb. He suspected that it had caffeine in it, and indeed, uh, Yoko did have caffeine, and in knocking back their morning calabash of Yoko, the Ingano were taking in a single draft roughly the equivalent of 40 cups of coffee. Uh, they were not a people to do things in half measures. He continued down in the forest to the homeland of the Kofan, the greatest manipulators of medicinal, toxic, and hallucinogenic plants, arguably in the Northwest Amazon. Even the deportment of the people is a conscious attempt to mimic the, the, the costume of the visionary beings they encounter when they take ayahuasca. And of course, his mission was to find the botanical source of the arrow poisons. At McGill in 1943, scientists had isolated detubocurarine, a powerful muscle relaxant that had revolutionized an abdominal surgery, but the botanical source remained unknown. So Schultes was looking for the botanical source of these curious poisons, but he found himself in a complete world of ethnopharmacological wonder. These curious ichthyotoxins that yield rotenone, our most important biodegradable insecticide, placed into slow bodies of water. The toxin interferes with respiration in the gills of the fish. It's completely biodegradable. The fish float to the surface and can be readily harvested. And so he collected over seven different species in this one village alone used to create what the indigenous people call the flying death. And more importantly, he realized that he was now in a world of wonder where he no longer was the master, he was a student. And he never forgot that. And from the Kofan then, he began to, the first of his many epic river journeys that frankly dwarfed the achievements of Richard Bruce. And in dugout canoes, he sailed all the way down the Putumayo River and in doing so, he ended up going through a glass darkly and coming into the shadow of one of the most horrific um, events that had ever occurred in the history of South America. All of it was about this tree. The Indians, of course, called it caucho, the weeping tree, and for generations they had been slicing into its cambion to gather the white latex, which they formed into 
strange objects. Uh, Columbus, for example, saw Arawakan Indians playing with balls that bounced and flew, and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin thought it was very useful for rubbing off their pencil notations, and since they thought it came from India, they called it India rubber. But of course, it came from the Amazon, and the Portuguese had already established a fledgling cottage industry, but there was just one problem. In hot weather, a rubber cape melted like a sticky shroud, and in cold, water, in cold weather, a pair of rubber boots cracked like porcelain. And it was only the serendipitous discovery of vulcanization by Charles Goodyear that transformed rubber from a, a curiosity into a vital commodity of the industrial age. And when that happened, the flash of wealth was mesmerizing. In 1888, John Dunlop invented the rubber tire so that his kid could win a tricycle race in Belfast. By 1898, a decade later, there were 50 automobile companies in America alone. Oldsmobile, the biggest, made 425 cars in 1901. But within another decade, Henry Ford would be making the first of 15 million Model Ts. And all of them needed rubber, and the only source was the Amazon. The, the wealth was simply incredible, and within, um, by 1910, rubber um, made up over 40% of all of Brazil's export. In Pittsburgh, steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie lent mented, I should have chosen rubber. In Paris and London, men flipped coins to decide whether to go after gold in the Klondike or black gold in the Amazon. In Manaus, situated at the heart of the trade, men slaked the thirst of their horses with chilled buckets of champagne while their women sent their laundry back to Portugal to be clean because they disdained the murky waters of the Amazon. And all of this was made possible because of three species in the genus Hevea that grew broadly dispersed across the Amazon basin as a biological, ecological adaptation to protect them from their main predator, which was a pernicious fungal disease called the South American leaf blight, which invariably proved catastrophic if rubber trees were concentrated in plantations in the Americas. And that Accident of biology determined the economics of the trade. In order to get to the rubber, the trees scattered through the forest, perhaps 300 million individuals of Hevea brasiliensis alone, you had to mobilize huge amounts of labor. And when even the influx of thousands of impoverished peasants from the Brazilian northeast proved inadequate, insufficient to the task, the rubber barons had to turn to the Indian people of the forest, and now they had a quandary. How does, do you secure to the yoke of the trade indigenous people who faced with adversity could simply flee into the forest? And the solution was terror. And the horrific abuses unleashed upon women and children and men in the rubber era defies imaginings. One priest who was there on the Rio Putumayo, which became known as the River of Death, said to Schultes that the best thing that could be said about white people in that era was that they didn't kill their Indians for sport. And so as the trade flourished, the Indians suffered. And in the end, for every ton of rubber produced, 10 Indians would die and hundreds of others be left scarred for life. And in the end, perhaps ironically, what saved the Indian people was an act of British imperial policy. The rubber seed is very susceptible to fermentation, and it was only with the arrival of fast steamships that the British could actually safely get rubber, viable rubber seeds out of Brazil, which they did. They got to Liverpool, a royal train took them to special hothouses at Kew, and eventually, with special glass deck of ships, they were shipped overseas to the Royal Botanic Garden in Singapore, and there they could be grown in plantation because the South American leaf blight does not exist there. And once these plantations came online, the reversal of fortunes was incredible. In 1910, Brazil still produced roughly half the world's rubber supply, but by 1934, as automobile manufacturing surpassed a million units for the first time, Brazil had become a net importer of the product that she had given the world. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. This was the situation in December 8, 1941, when Richard Evans Schultes, at a mission post near Makoa on the Putumayo, heard crackling over the radio news of Pearl Harbor. 
At this point in time, U.S. domestic consumption of rubber was 600,000 uh, metric tons, all of it coming in from Southeast Asia, where 97% of the world's rubber production was grown. Within six weeks, the Japanese had taken all of it, and we were in a perilous, perilous situation. Every Sherman tank had 20 tons of rubber, and, uh, 20 tons of steel and half a ton of rubber. Every battleship sunk at Pearl Harbor had 30,000 rubber parts. Every mile of wiring at every domestic and military insta installation throughout the free world was insulated with latex cut from a tree. It was an incredible crisis to which the government responded. The speed limit dropped in America for 30 miles an hour, to 30 miles an hour, not for want of petroleum, but to protect our, our modest rubber supplies that came from Liberia and what we could get from wild type from the Amazon. Um, the Allies only got through 1943 with the most massive recycling campaign in the history of the world. You could turn in rubber products at 400,000 depots in America alone. Even Roosevelt's dog Fala had his pet bones, his rubber bones, melted down. Secondly, the the government sent the order to the synthetic chemists if they couldn't find a way to make a million metric tons of serviceable synthetic rubber within a year and a million metric tons of the precursors at a time when the U.S. domestic gross domestic product was $98.7 billion at, and, and, and direct orders to government, a million dollars rather, direct orders to government in the first year of war, it surpassed $100 million. So there was a huge competition for material and men. All would be lost. We had no precursor for synthetic rubber. Uh, DuPont made 4,000 tons of a serviceable rubber for battery casings, but that was it, useless for tires. The third order was to send botanical explorers under the urgency of wartime conditions to every corner of the free world to squeeze every drop of latex out of every latex-bearing plant we could find. We had Russian dandelions growing in 43 states and seven Canadian prov provinces as a source of latex. And Schultes, given his expertise in the Amazon, was given the most difficult task of all, to go back and squeeze latex, not out of the forest, but to persuade Indian people who not a generation before had been tortured for the, in the midst of the rubber, um, uh, the, the first rubber boom, he had to persuade them to go back in the forest to secure rubber for an allied effort of which they knew nothing. But he managed to do it. And he had heard that the mother load was on a river called the Apoporis, which was completely unknown, represented on maps of Colombia by a dotted red line 1,500 miles in length. The Carijona, supposedly a cannibalistic tribe, lived in the mythical headwaters. And Schultes then began a series of incredible expeditions, cutting tracks through the forest, dragging boats 14 days across corduroy roads, reaching into these rivers, and eventually discovering the very mountains that today bear his name, the national park that is named for him, mountains that no other explorer had seen, Cerro Campania, deeply significant to Makuna mythology. And in all these months, Schultes used to say he had to cover his eyes as he walked through the forest for fear of seeing yet another new species that he was not able to collect. And then his mission, having gotten to the headwaters of the Apoporos, he was to go down the river counting rubber trees as he went along to estimate how much rubber could be extracted from this remote drainage. He was told no matter what he did, don't go belong beyond the cataracts of Hirihirimo, where the entire river disappears beneath the earth for five kilometers. He was declared lost and presumed dead in September of 1943, and four months later, word reached Bogota from an isolated Catholic mission that an American botanist who actually acted more English than American was painting their church blue. And what this meant is that Schultes, having run out of gas, had traveled the entire length of the river so sacred to the Makuna. In seven months, he counted 17,000 rubber trees. He estimated the drainage contained 16 million trees altogether that could yield 6.5 million pounds for the rubber air effort. But increasingly, by the end of 1943, the Allies realized that this effort to secure latex wasn't going to make much difference. Even at the height of the rubber boom, when 5,000 adventurers a week poured into the Amazon, 
Brazil produced about 50,000 metric tons. We now had to produce a million metric tons in the, to fuel the most important industrial expansion in the history of civilization, the arming of the Allied cause. So increasingly, the efforts of the plant explorers in 1943 shifted from securing raw tonnage of latex to solving the ultimate problem, to find a way to grow rubber in the Americas despite the blight, so that never again would we be held hostage by a foreign power taking control of the plantations of Southeast Asia. It wasn't as if the captains of industry hadn't known about the problem. Henry Ford, at the height of his power, spent $25 million in the 1920s at a place of, called Fordlandia and later Belterra. He sent his agronomists to Southeast Asia where they begged, borrowed, or stole the finest clonal um, material of Hevia brasiliensis. Now this is critical because the botanists in Southeast Asia had figured out that the best way to increase latex yield was to propagate the plant vegetatively, not from seed. And that meant that the entire plantation industry was essentially a single genetic clone of the handful of seeds that Wickham took out in 1877. And when they brought that material back into the Amazon and planted it on an area of land half the size of Connecticut, Everything seemed fine until the leaves flushed out. And then the blight that was virulent, uh, was latent in the forest became virulent in the plantations. And I spoke to a pathologist who was there at the time and he said it was as if God himself had a blowtorch that simply eliminated the investment. And out of that disaster came the greatest fear. It was shown that the process of selecting for high yield in Southeast Asia had made ecotypes even more susceptible to the blight, which meant that if the blight ever got over there, it could mean the end of the industry. But out of disaster came hope, because out of the millions of trees that died, a handful survived wild type from around the Amazon. That suggested the possibility that somewhere in this forest, like looking for a needle in a proverbial haystack, you could find the real bleeders, high-yielding, disease-resistant rubber trees. And Schultes was sent out on that quixotic mission to find those trees. And for three years, he lived in the forest seeking those individual hevia trees. Finally, in the homeland of the Tacuna Indians, in the environs of Leticia, he found them. He spent three tapping seasons with the Serengueros, studying 6,000 individual hevia trees as if they were his children. And every year, he collected himself, with his helpers, over 600,000, sometimes a million hevia seeds, each one of which had to be individually inspected and cleaned, placed in sawdust, and flown out to the agricultural research stations in Costa Rica and the Caribbean. And this was the germplasm that was going to be the basis of an American-based, disease-resistant rubber industry. Well, with the end of the war, um, the crisis seemed to be resolved. The dream of the rubber explorers was about to be realized. And in this wonderful accident of American bureaucracy, the U.S. Department of Agriculture forgot that Schultes was on their payroll. And they simply kept cutting him checks so he could do anything he wanted. And so from 1945 until 1953, Schultes simply rambled. On just one of his journeys up the Rio Negro, he surpassed the distance that Spruce had gone, and he got all the way to the very headwaters of the Rio Negro, which were to exist on any other continent, would of course be the second longest river on earth. And with his beloved companion, Pacho Lopez, he got to the very headwaters when suddenly his fingers got numb. He thought it was a formaldehyde. No, then his toes got numb. And he realized that a thousand miles from the nearest village, he, a, a town, he was coming down with beriberi, a potentially lethal disease based on vitamin nutrition. He came down to a mission post. The missionary said, don't bother going down to Manaus, just go up this portage, get to the Colombian military station at La Pedrera. For Schultes, a choice between Brazil and Colombia was no choice at all. He headed upstream, but the problem was the missionary's geography was wrong. It wasn't a couple days up to the portage. It was two weeks. It wasn't a few hours across the portage. It was two days on feet that felt like stumps. And then when finally they broke through to the other side, I should say that as he made that portage, he came upon nomadic Maku Indians 
and all of his agony did not stop him from taking ayahuasca, and he ended up discovering not only a new species, but a new genus of this most revered of all psychoactive lianas. And then when they got to the rivers, they lost all of their gear. They finally made their way down to La Pedrera, and he said to the sergeant who met him at the dock, when is the next plane for Bogota? And the sergeant began to laugh. And Schultes asked again, and the sergeant said two words, la violencia, the euphemism for the civil war that had convulsed Colombia in the 18 months that Schultes had been on the Rio Negro. There hadn't been a plane to that military post in six months. There wasn't going to be one in six months. Schultes had gone almost 700 miles out of his way, only to be that much further from rescue. By the time he was bundled off this riverboat in Manaus, half dead, his last words before passing out, he noticed a riverboat belonging to the American Chicle Company. His last words were, hire that boat. And you would have thought that after almost two years in the jungle, having had malaria 24 times, he might have rested a few days. Two days later, he had himself carried in a hammock with a bunch of syringes and a bunch of, uh, of thiamine onto this boat, and he then headed up the second of the biggest affluents of the Amazon, the Rio Madera, all in pursuit of a rare individual species of wild rubber. This was the man that we were fortunate to study with. And this is when he embarked on his incredible ethnobotanical explorations, free completely now with Catalinas to get anywhere in the northwest Amazon, he lived in this sea of forest, establishing rubber stations on his own where he treated the Indian people with fairness and justice. And of course, he became completely captiv captivated by their metaphysical realm. Th this is where he collected the medicinal plants, 2,000 botanical specimens previously unknown to science. He lived with the indigenous people as one with the indigenous people, attending these fantastic festivals like the Cayare and the Mediti Parana, and eventually, of course, ingesting at every conceivable opportunity ayahuasca and, and yopo and all the magic plants that are the essence of the shaman's repertoire, living in these longhouses decorated with the visions of the, of the beings. And of course, he took great delight in chewing Amazonian coca, and for the rest of his life, he would tell anyone who would listen that coca was the greatest of all stimulants. And of course, the people came to revere him almost as a ghost-like presence. He was, after all, the first person to treat them decently in a world where indigenous people's encounters with the outsiders had been largely um, with missionaries trying to steal their souls, uh, transform their lives with rubber barons exploiting their labor, with traders raping their daughters. And here was this solitary student of plants with no ax to grind who came to them as a student and sat at their feet learning from them. I know my, my friend Andrew Weil was another student of Schulte's when he first went to the Northwest Amazon in 1968. A Colombian professor advised him, and this after all is an area the size of France, if you ever get in trouble anywhere in that country, just mention Schulte's name. In that country, Schulte's is God. And so this incredible world of exploration was unfolding all the time he was thinking that this dream of a new rubber plantation industry was, was going to come about. But of course, he had no idea of the machinations going on back in Washington. In 1953, the rubber program was taken over by the State Department from USDA. The order went out that rubber was not for Latin America. The clonal gardens that grew the rare germplasm collected at tremendous cost of treasure and blood from an entire continent uh, were chopped to the ground, the files were seized and um, uh, uh, set, a, set away. Um, and this wasn't some kind of dark conspiracy. I'm a Canadian, and I've never met an American who keep, could keep a secret, let alone mount a conspiracy. It was just an <laughs> egregious example of bureaucratic idiocy, that and blind faith in the future of synthetic rubber. Because synthetic rubber had, in fact, won the war. And at a cost of $673 million, our Jeeps rolled into Berlin on rubber tires made in a factory. Factories that were in Louisiana and Texas where the emerging petrochemical industry was based. And those advancements had come so quickly there was a thought that these would reduce natural rubber to a footnote of history. But none of these bureaucrats anticipated one critical thing. 
First, the development of the radial tire. Every radial tire must have natural rubber in the sidewall and in the belt for strength. And more importantly, air, airline travel. Every plane you've ever traveled on has tires that are 100% cut from a tree. Only natural rubber has a tensile properties to be able to survive the transition from sub-zero temperatures to the friction of impact at 250, 300 kilometers an hour as the plane hits the tarmac. As a result, we use more rubber today than ever before. It is all still sourced from Southeast Asia. A sort of Damocles, in the words of one pathologist I interviewed, hangs over the neck of the industrial world. The South American leaf blight, another said, was the AIDS of the rubber industry. And it's only an accident of biology that the blight has not gotten to Southeast Asia. And if any of you ever gone to countries like Malaysia, you'll remember that you get off the plane and you walk through a pool of water. That's not a pool of water, it's fungicide to make sure you're not carrying the blight. No country that grows rubber allows any plane to drop right into it from any country known to harbor the blight. And so literally we live in this world where a single act of biological terrorism or the, in, the accidental introduction of uh, the, the spores to Southeast Asia could have an enormous impact on an industry upon which we are as dependent today as we were in 1941. And none of this had to happen if we had just allowed the dream of the botanists to be realized and had not all of their efforts been cancelled by a string of the stroke of a single bureaucrat's pen. But none of this made Schultes a bitter man. He simply, it simply reaffirmed his faith that all bureaucrats were fools, and it sent him back to Harvard where he devoted the rest of his life to those who would follow in his wake. Schultes, more than any other scholar or professor I ever knew, really did live by the adage that the student was as important as the teacher in the lineage of knowledge. When I was a young sophomore, I burst into his office one day unannounced uh, and found myself staring down at the president of Harvard, Derek Bach, who was in the middle of a meeting with Schultes. I began to spew apologies, retreating towards the door, and Schultes stopped me and he said, Mr. President, could you please get out of the office? There's a student to see me. That's, that's how, that was Schultes. And so, you know, in a, in a symposium that celebrates the great Lord Alfred Wallace, I think it's wonderful to, to recall that he, he and Spruce and Bates really did live on to fire the hearts of generations as yet unborn, just as a man like Schultes will do the same and has done the same. He is, in fact, the godfather of virtually every ethnobotanist working around the world today. Thank you very much. <laughs>